So um, when you're not culturally competent, there is a risk that you run as a lawyer of uh, potentially uh, facing some, some liability or potentially discipline from your legal regulator, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, in this particular province. Um, you can give the wrong advice to a client if, if, they are, if you're not culturally competent, but yeah, which could involve negligence. Um, and there's also in some criminal cases in the last few years, and there's an example I'll give after of a, of a situation where it was alleged that the, the lawyer, the, the fellow, the accused lawyer, he was convicted and then it was overturned, um, was uh, uh, not culturally confident, com competent in what the fellow argued was that he had received ineffective counsel. And that's what his conviction was overturned on the basis of, that he had received ineffective counsel. Um, so these are, these are pretty serious issues, and, and after that, in, the, in fact, in that particular case, a lawyer was involved in some discipline after that. Um, and so there's a, di a couple of different ways that uh, one can be culturally competent. Well, you have to be culturally competent in all these ways, but there's more than one way <laughs> is guess what I'm trying to say. So the first one I think is important and often a little bit overlooked is um, with respect to knowing substantive law as it relates to certain social groups in Canada. Because, as you will come to learn, um, there are different ways in which the law apply to different groups in society. I mean, you're going to learn a lot about it when I come and talk to you in OTL on Aboriginal people, but there, there is some different uh, statutes that apply to First Nations people living on reserve. They're, they have some different constitutional rights. Um, and uh, there are other groups in society, such as immigrants, who also have uh, different rules that apply to them. So if you're not aware of these differences sometime and assume that the law applies as it would as to say more generally to other groups, uh, then you run some risks. So I'm going to give you some real life examples of this. Um, and this was an example when I first created this, this scenario about, well not scenario, but this presentation about five years ago, but speaking with Emma, this is still a problem today. She's dealing with this issue. We're not going to give names or anything, but it's a criminal lawyer advising a client uh, to plead guilty to, uh, to uh, a crime, perhaps not because they might be guilty, but rather because administratively it might be easier or what have you. However, not knowing and not taking into account that the person has landed immigrant status and the impact of pleading guilty to a crime if you are a landed immigrant is that you can be deported. So that's having, so the person took that lawyer's advice and now is faced with a deportation order. So that is a hugely significant uh, unintended consequence of this lawyer not knowing that intersection between immigration law and criminal law. Um, another one that this is, this is for me many years ago now, not me who was the one giving the wrong advice, but I was approached by a First Nation band about giving them a second opinion on some tax advice that they had gotten. They would gotten into, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but a pretty seriously bad deal on something. And they wanted to know whether they should continue to be in it. And they had received this uh, advice from a tax lawyer who had said, well, uh, oh, Indians who live on reserves, and what I mean by that is First Nations, um, there's these provisions, and I'll talk a little bit about my presentation next time, but about garnishment and seizure, and people cannot generally come seize assets on the reserve. So if somebody usually has a judgment against you, meaning you, you were, you know, they went to court and they got a, an award against you, they could come seize your assets, right? This, somebody could come seize my house down the street or whatever. But if you're on a reserve, you can't, people cannot come seize assets. So, um, so this tax lawyer said, yeah, go ahead, go get involved with this pretty risky deal um, because uh, even if somebody sues you, they can't come take your stuff on the reserve. They can't come uh, access the bank accounts on the reserve. But that's actually not true and the lawyer did not have a good appreciation of the law. And so, anyway, uh, I promptly advised the band that yes, they can come seize your assets and bank accounts located off reserve. And so, immediately they backed out of that very risky business deal. But again, another example of people really not knowing the intersections between these areas and giving really bad advice as a consequence. The, the, the solution is not to say, well, okay, fine. Anytime somebody who might be an immigrant or, or an Aboriginal person walks into my office, I'm going to be like, I can't deal with you. No. The proper solution is to say, I need to learn about how this is going to impact you know, how I give advice in this area. Okay, so moving on. Cultural competency is also about the ability to communicate effectively with your client. And that means understanding the whole contextual background factors that they may uh, come from. And, you know, I mean, this can affect a variety of uh, how people express themselves. So there's many ways that um, 
perceptions and behaviors vary according to culture. So you can have eye contact, nonverbal communication, approaches to problem solving, notions of sin, um, uh, concepts of justice, notions of family. I mean, there's just all kinds. And I think Robert goes into this a bit more in his presentation. Um, and the point of being culturally competent is not just being aware that there are these differences, but being open to them and through this just getting a better understanding of, of your clients and their needs. And not just sort of making assumptions based on stereotypes, like why are they acting that way? That's so weird or, you know, I don't understand them or what they're getting at. You gotta, you gotta get beyond that. Um, and there's, you know, lots of examples on this, but I'll just give one for the sake of time. Um, and a famous one in, in Nova Scotia, which is the case of Donald Marshall Jr., mm -hmm. um, who was wrongfully convicted and served 11 years of a life sentence uh, for the murder of Sandy Seal, when it was in fact Roy Ebsary, who was an, uh, a white man who, uh, yeah, who, who went undetected from the law for a long period of time. Anyway, after Marshall um, was released, there was a Royal Commission report uh, into his wrongful conviction that found that the justice system had essentially failed him at every point, right? including his own lawyers. And, um, and what they found with respect to his own lawyers is that they did a pretty ineffective job of representing him. They, including, they, they got a call from an eye, somebody who said they were an eyewitness, who said that they saw Epsbury or not, uh, anyway, who, who placed, basically exonerated uh, Marshall and they just kind of ignored that. Um, they also um, yeah, did some other, you know, um, anyway, there was other ways that they handled the, the investigation of their client's case that just really show that they kind of, they just believe that he was guilty. And uh, one thing that was brought up was that they just kind of assumed because he was quiet and young and Mi'kmaq and also, um, you know, there's this thing in Mi'kmaq culture often that young people do not look people who are older than them in the eye. And, you know, to somebody who's having a conversation with somebody, that might seem that they're, they're not being truthful because they never look you in the eye. But that just tends to be a cultural trait, again. Anyway, so some, some examples of how, you know, communication styles can differ and also how assumptions can be formed. So it's not, cultural competency is not only just, uh, cultural competency is not only just knowing uh, how you understand or um, your clients um, different uh, backgrounds and history, but also you, kinda, you have to be aware about how other people may or may not um, uh, address cultural competence issues, what their biases may be, and, and, and stereotypes, and, and how that can impact on your client's case. And that one's really key, and, and we have to become more vocal about addressing that and talking about these things. And there's nothing wrong with talking about these things. In fact, we should talk about these things. There's a famous case here, you may cover it still in criminal law, RDS, which was uh, about a, um, a judge here in Nova Scotia who she was African Nova Scotian, the accused was African Nova Scotian, his lawyer was African Nova Scotian, and it was, you know, it, part of the argument in that case was that the police officer sort of overreacted, and, and the judge agreed with that, and she said something about that in her reasons. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada about whether she was biased for having, you know, raised the issue of systemic discrimination here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And, and, and it went all the way up there. And there the Supreme Court said, well, of course you can talk about it. Any reasonable person would know that there's racism in Halifax, systemic racism in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And she, which it's, she's not to be perceived as being biased for having mentioned it. So that's a, a really important case. Um, so we have to be aware of the histories of the communities that we serve and be aware that racism and discrimination can occur not just at an individual level, but at a systemic level. Yeah, you can't automatically assume that the law and the systems that uh, support the law are always neutral and that your clients are necessarily always going to get a fair shake. You have to be alive to the possibilities of individual and systemic bias um, and take a critical view and, if necessary, uh, raise those issues. Um, I'll give you one more example before I wrap it up because my time's coming to a close pretty quickly. But this is a fairly recent one from a few years ago, uh, Fraser, that was in your material. So Mr. Fraser is an African Nova Scotian teacher charged with sexual touching of a student who was a young white woman. Uh, he was convicted by a jury who had been all white. He appealed his conviction on the basis of ineffective counsel. So basically, prior to trial, he sees the, the, the composition of the jury, all white. He raises it to his lawyer, who is also white, and, and, he, and he basically says, well, I don't know, I'm kind of nervous about, you know, the, the jury. There's no one who's African Nova Scotian, given that the victim is also white. Maybe there's, a, there's an issue here. And his lawyer was fairly dismissive. In, in that. He said, oh, don't worry, I've gotten, I've gotten other black guys off in front of all white juries all the time. 
<laughs> and the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal found that that was inappropriate. Like that was that was just too dismissive. Basically, um, <clears throat> he did not take his client's concern seriously when they're you know it's recognized. I mean, the Supreme Court of Canada has taken judicial notice of the fact that there is systemic racism in Nova Scotia and in Halifax, right? Um, and, and and have recognized that there can be racial bias on juries. And there's cases that say that you can actually test members of juries on their on their systemic bias. And, and his, his lawyer didn't do any of that stuff. He didn't even know about that area of law, which is, again, this thing about where there's this intersection. You've got to know about the sort of people that you're servicing and, and how the law can affect that. Um, so I think I'm pretty much going to leave it there. I used to do this presentation and go on and make a business case about why it's important to be culturally competent. And I, I think there is definitely a business case, but I don't think I need to sell that business case because I just think it's something that we have to have. It's not, I mean, I think it does. If, certainly I've been working with the First Nations community for about 10 years, um, I'm about eight years in my practice, and it's, it's been good for my practice and my firm. And, and there are other uh, firms that do work with particular communities, and I think that there's lots of needs there that can be serviced and it, and it can be good for the bottom line of firms and different practices. But that's beside the point. Really, it's just that this is core uh, you know, uh, skills that lawyers have to have, as Emma sort of set out. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to my friend Robert. Thank you.